The Trumpet Daily program begins right now. Today's world news, what it means, where it's taking us. I bring you the one and only possible message of royal peace. This is a message of hope, tremendous hope. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again. The Trumpet Daily program begins right now. You guys are amazing. I mean, you really, really have incredible talent. And uh, when we heard the story about all the connections and all the family and stuff, it's, that makes it even more special. So I just want to say thank you guys very much for all that you're doing. Because you're actually out there, you're inspiring this nation. When you go, when you run around New England and up and down the seaboard, wherever else you go, you're, you're, you are inspiring this nation. And that's something that we need right now. So. So thanks for doing that, okay? All of you, every single one of you, every single one of you has amazing talent. So thank you very much and, and uh, thank you for your smile. There you have it, General Michael Flynn in town, in Edmond, Oklahoma, visiting Armstrong uh, Auditorium yesterday afternoon as he was one of the audience members to view the encore performance of Celtic Throne. We have him in town for tonight's engagement in the same venue. And of course, as I told you last week, he's also right here in the studio with us. So we'll get to our interview with General Flynn in just a moment. You're listening to Stephen Flurry, and this is the Trumpet Daily. You can get to the live video stream of this show at uh, trumpetdaily.com. And of course, don't forget about our Rumble channel. We're going to be off the charts today as Rumble's giving us some extra promotional uh, efforts to broadcast this show or to promote this show. And, uh, and General Flynn has as well. We appreciate you sending out the tweet about the show to your followers. It's wonderful. I mean, it's a great experience for me being here uh, in, back in Oklahoma and being in Edmond and being uh, on the uh, Armstrong, uh, Armstrong College campus. What a beautiful, beautiful location. And, you know, even though we're going through a heat wave, I'm coming up from Florida, so it's not, it's not that bad. <laughs> I actually enjoy it. And, uh, and I'm, glad that, uh, I'm glad to be here with the audience today. And I really, really look forward to a couple of hours of a great discussion. Great. I can't tell, just to go back to Celtic Throne, I can't tell you how excited the performers were. A lot of them are, you know, 10, 12 years of age, in their right. teens, early 20s. And uh, when they heard that you were coming and that you would most likely be in attendance, they yeah. really were yeah. excited to rev up the show again. Well, I mean, for me, and you saw a little piece there, but I just went through the, uh, they have an elementary school here on, uh, on the installation on the campus. And I met with uh, kindergartners, first graders, second graders, third graders, and I sat down with the fifth grade uh, a group of kids. We took some photos and stuff, but we, but we talked about, you know, the kinds of things that are going on in their lives. And you see these like faces and it just makes you, and I, you know, one of the, one of the young uh, girls that I met in the fifth grader, she has the same name as my granddaughter. So it's very personal for me. And uh, you know, they're, she's 11 years old. And when I look at the faces of these children, that's why I do what I do. And I always tell people I have, I have four grandchildren, so I have four reasons to uh, fight uh, for our country the way that I fight for our country as I go around uh, across the country to, to, to raise our voices and, uh, and make sure people understand what it is that we're up against and what we're, and how to, how to uh, you know, how as American citizens, how we can step up and stand up and speak up and, uh, and get out of this, this uh, sort of America in crisis, right? I mean, that's, sort of where we're at today. So it's a, just a real honor for me to be here. Uh, the, the, um, seeing those children last night, seeing those, which is one big family, this Celtic throne, I mean, just amazing. And then seeing the, uh, the children this morning, many of whom participated in that, uh, in, in last night's uh, just, just beautiful piece of artwork, really, when you think about it, these people, these young kids floating across the stage. Right. Just wonderful, wonderful uh, experience for me. And you got to enjoy our swimming pool yeah. today as well. Uh, swimming, How was yeah. that? <laughs> I was swimming. I went. Yeah, I met. I met. Uh, I swim. So I, you know, because my my bones and my uh, my body has been t has taken a beating of jumping out of airplanes for so many years of my life, my military career, and and uh, running and push ups and all that kind of stuff. So I enjoy swimming. I've always enjoyed swimming as a from the time I was a kid. I surf. I, I've been surfing, uh, wave surfing for over fifty years of my life. I still own, I think, eight or nine surfboards. Water polo. These guys, water polo. I played water polo in college. These guys, uh, when 
when Steve was uh, tour, tooling me around the campus yesterday, it was great. Um, the, uh, and one of the things, he, when we went up and we saw the athletic facilities, beautiful athletic facilities, I saw a pool and I go, oh, is, is that, you know, can anybody swim in that pool? He goes, sure. And I said, boy, I'd love to go for a swim in the morning. So uh, I was able to get in that uh, pool about 7.30. I actually did a, had an interview with the local radio station from the pool and then uh, went and swam uh, a bunch of laps. And it's just, it's really, it's refreshing. And it's my, it's sort of my safe space when I go into the water and I, and water is a great metaphor for, I think, a lot of uh, the things that we're facing in this country today, because water can be turbulent, tides, you know, ebb and flow. Uh, there's, there's tidal waves, there's big waves. Uh, the ocean can be very powerful uh, but we also have to, and it can cause us to, I, I've been, I've been uh, crushed by big waves, driven underneath and had to stay underneath for a long periods of time. And uh, you, get, you can, you can uh, get, get a sense of fear. And what you learn, particularly in the, in the, uh, the lifetime of surfing that I've done, you, you learn to not, you don't lose fear, but you overcome it and you're able to control it. And you're able to rise back above. And that's kind of where America's at. And I think America right now, is in that that ebb and flow of the of the of the big tides and this big ocean that that is our is our beautiful country, and and I think a lot of people are uh, fearful to a degree. I really do believe that. And so what I want to try to do is get people to understand how to control their uh, their fear and control that emotion. You don't lose it, but you can control it. And once you've controlled it, then you are in total control of your life. And that's how you can move forward. That's how we move. We'll, that's how we will move forward as a nation. And we're going to do it. We're going to move forward as a nation because we're going to be able to control that that element of fear. And that's where hope comes in. That's where inspiration comes in. And that's where each of us in our own communities, particularly this beautiful community that you guys have created here, uh, it just proves to me once again how we can take control of our lives here in America and move this country forward the way that we know it must be uh, driven. And uh, so that's kind of me. That's what, what I, it's one of the things that I really like to, uh, you know, I talk about that and I, and, and that's a little bit about me. So I appreciate you asking me about swimming. I appreciate you opening up that <laughs> pool, outdoor pool, Oklahoma, you know, it had a heat wave. So the, the temperature was about right. And, uh, and uh, it was wonderful to be able to do that. Just a, one more point on, living a life that's active or mm -hmm. getting involved in sports you on the trip out here you had mentioned about president trump and how that when he was he's obviously in his late 70s now he's still very energetic and vibrant and you you talked about how that when early in his life he was an avid baseball player yeah. and very active and into sports how how do you feel like you know, you saw these kids perform yesterday. How important is it for young people to have activities and sports and competitive type things that that goes toward, you know, developing their character? Yeah, I think that it's, it's hugely important. And, and what I was talking about with Steve on our trip up was really about, you know, people look at a guy like Donald Trump and, you know, there's so many so many things that are that are just falsehoods as to the way the media presents about him. They're just absolutely horrific in many cases. But, you know, and just to touch on him uh, before uh, the main point, you know, Trump is a man who's never smoked, never drank. He, his parents lived till they were in their 90s. He's a very, very healthy guy. I mean, when I, when I was running around him and you see him at these big, still these big rallies, uh, when he was uh, in uh, high school, and when he was in his younger days, he was a he was really a, uh, particularly at the at the in, in baseball. He was sort of at the professional level. I mean, he was a great athlete. And all you got to do is go back and look at his young life. So athletics is is something that I think uh, for me, because I was always uh, athletically inclined and I you know, was in sports. I was on championship teams. I, I did a variety of things, not just surfing and swimming. I played, you know, basketball, baseball football in high school. I got back into swimming in college and started playing water polo. And I think that our character can be strengthened by the teamwork that we get involved in. And I think that's really what it's about, because it's not just about the, you know, those that are really the top athletes in a particular sport. It's about joining you know, and, 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 and participating 
in some type of, of sporting competitions or sporting events, partly because it's good for your health, if nothing else. It, it causes you to have to focus on being part of a team and working as a team. And, and I can tell you as a kid way back, you know, playing in all the different sports and, and being part of boys clubs, for, as an example, I swam at boys clubs, I learned how to box at boys clubs. That, that uh, developed me as I got into the military and I get into the army when you're really, now you're gonna have to really work as a, even a, a closer member of a, of a, of a, uh, of a team. And I think that, that, that uh, the teamwork, the character development, the leader development, uh, the, the idea about maintaining a healthy lifestyle, because as you get older, you know, you, life, you know, as anybody that's watching this that's, old, that's older, it's in my, I'm 64 years old today, uh, or, or you know, now my, my, uh, my birthday is in another couple of months, I'll turn 65. I mean, I, I, uh, I want to live a long, healthy life, and I want to do that because you know, I think that this moment of history needs a lot of different people, and I feel blessed to be alive right now. And so this idea of being involved in sports, being involved in any sort of competition, watching those, those young people last night, I mean, the, the strength, the ability, their, 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 their sort of artistic performance, the way that they were synchronized on that stage, and, you know, it's like I, I, I will say it as a sort of Irish step dancing, right? There's a lot of Irish step dancing, just beautiful. And for anybody that hasn't seen it, you're watching these, these, uh, these amazing, amazing, talented young people. They're like floating across the stage. I mean, they just float across the stage. And yet they're, you know, they're moving their feet at a rate that I, you know, I can't even imagine. But the Celtic Throne was a beautiful performance of not only um, our culture and the culture of the world, and as they brought the story through the whole couple of acts that they performed last night, all the way through to how that, those strong cultures of, of uh, the Irish, uh, the Scottish, the British came into our country, uh, it was beautiful. And I think that that's, uh, that's a big part of, of what we need to always remember is the strength of, uh, and strength comes from this competitive spirit of America, but it's not only the strength of being an athlete, it's the strength of being one of good character, and that drives all the way into the diversity of this beautiful country of ours. You were saying, uh, just following on that, you were saying last night, uh, because of where you are in your life, you're, as you say, you're in your 60s, and then you see young people, we, some of us were asking you, you know, what is it that really drives you and motivates you? I mean, aside from Donald Trump, you're, you're maybe one of the most persecuted yeah. <laughs> Americans in the yeah. nation. So what is it that keeps you going and keeps you positive and keeps you personally hopeful? Yeah, I, I can't, you know, I mean, people send me these quotes from the Bible all the time about, you know, th those that have been persecuted in the Bible and, you know, and I, I won't, I won't try to quote that because I'm not, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, on that, I just I feel it though. Um, you know, when you talk about why 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 do I get persecuted the way that I get persecuted? You know, and and you go back and you look at Trump, I, and I I jokingly say, you know, if he's getting a subpoena or something, I I'm probably getting one. I mean, I you know I just was on the phone this morning on on all this stuff. I mean, the. One of the things that, that exists in life is, and I say this, I said this in, uh, in um, I think, in the, we were talking earlier about the 2016 convention, where I spoke at the 2016 convention, and during that speech, I, I made the statement that the sobering reality is that evil exists, and I want people to understand that. The sobering reality is that evil exists, and evil exists in mankind, it exists in humanity, it exists on earth. And so we have to understand that, that there, are, uh, there are components of that that are they're, they're going to constantly attack sort of the, the opposite of that. They're gonna attack the good, they're gonna attack the light, they're gonna attack the truth, they're gonna attack what's good in our lives, right? And what's good in our lives, what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep our country on this even keel. Uh, you know, people, you know, we're a democracy, but we're actually a constitutional republic. And we have this beautiful 
We have this beautiful document um, that is our Constitution. I always carry our Constitution with us. And, uh, you know, beautiful, a uh, great picture of George Washington on the, on the front, the Constitution of the United States. It's only keepers the people, right? It's only keepers the people. And so for us to maintain this little, barely, you can barely see it there, audience, this little thing, got the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence in it. For us to be able to maintain this thing, we have to, um, we have to keep ourselves on this, on this uh, sort of authentic and honest path, right? And it doesn't mean that we're perfect. I'll be the, the you know, I'm, I'm the most imperfect guy, and I've made lots of mistakes. Um, but when we talk about the direction that we're going as a as a country, there there are few Americans today that are adults, at least, paying attention that have to maybe go to a job, raise a family, you know, pay for pay for mortgage or or rent in a in a place, go buy a loaf of bread, go, you know, go spend a. a you know, your money on a, on a gallon of gas these days, you know, it's four bucks a gallon. I mean, this is insane. So we all know that there's something not right about our country. And what people are having a hard time figuring out is, is this a Democrat versus Republican, right? We have, a, we have long in the tooth politicians that talk about our country like, well, you know, this is still my ideas about big government, your ideas about little government, my ideas about less taxes, your ideas about more taxes. We're past that. We are so past that. This 40, 50 years, and I can go back and, you know, we can have a class on, on U.S. history over the last 75 years since the end of World War II, if you'd like, but maybe we'll touch a little bit on that. But I go back to this idea that evil exists. The competition, so the competition that right now that we are facing is, a, is, is what I would call Americanism versus globalism, Okay. And there is a there is a globalist elite that and when I say globalist, they're not all sitting in Washington, D.C. There's a globalist elite that that actually looks at the world and says, we know what's better for for humanity. We know what's better for the global population. We know what's better for, you know, for the world and versus this idea about about uh, national sovereignty. Right. And I've been called every name in the book. You know, I'm not. I'm not, uh, I know what nationalism is, and I'm not talking about nationalism. I'm talking about taking care of our home first. And so it's like in life, right? If, you're, if your house is on, if, you're, if your stove has a stove fire because you, you know, it's a grease fire, what do you do? Do you walk outside and go, you know, park the car in the garage? No, you put the stove fire out. You put the fire out. You, you, you manage that fire. You get it to where you can control it. And maybe you grab the, you know, the pan that it was started in you and you take it out the back door and you throw it in the grass. Right. I mean, I, I've seen that. My, my mother did that one time and I, I, I watched that. And I'm like, you know, because she knew what to do. And so it's that simple of an example of an, in a, of an analogy that is happening to our country. We have we have fires going on in our country and yet we're spending billions and billions and billions of dollars over in places like Eastern Europe. We are we are allowing millions, we're allowing millions of people to invade our country, all right? Not just tens of millions, now it's hundreds of millions. I mean, we're really, we're in a place now where when we start to think about our country, you know, we don't really know. We had our census and our census says, you know, let's just say, I think it was 320 million people in this country. We really don't know what the other number is. I mean, in the last couple of years, we've seen, I think, five or six million people that we know of. So certainly tens of millions of people that are coming into our country illegally. And, and it's not just, you know, woe, woe is these people and where they're coming from. They, their lot in life is, is terrible. I understand all that, and I, and I have immense uh, uh, sadness for them. But what it causes inside of our country, it's like that stove fire that I just talked about. It could burn the kitchen. It could burn the you know, the dining room, it could burn the living room, it, it could burn the house down if we don't get it under control. And so when you start to think about, uh, and I call it killed in action, because this is like an American battlefield when we're talking about these drug cartels. So killed in action on the streets of America by fentanyl, by Chinese produced and made and, and, uh, and routed through the Mexican border, the southern border, you know, killed in action in this country is over 100,000 people, 
right? 100,000 Americans killed in action by uh, Chinese-produced fentanyl. And then the cost of our, on, on our health care system, the cost on our education system, the, the rising rates of crime, yet we have the, the, the globalist, all right, the globalist element, which is, which, you know, we can get into more def, defined as to who they are and particular ideologies, but that globalist element will tell you in everything that I just described, particularly the rising rates of crime, they'll say, uh, well, we want to defund the police. And what people don't realize is defunding the police, eliminating local policing is something that the, one of the things that the Bolshevik Re- revolution did way back in the uh, 100 years ago, right? So defunding the police means we want to eliminate local policing. But what, but what is it that our government is doing? So they want to eliminate your ability to be able to have local police take care of your local neighborhoods and your, your, your cities, your parishes, your towns, and your, and your counties. They really do. And they want to grow federal level police, you know, vis-a-vis 87,000 IRS agents. These are not accountants that they're hiring. And they're, you know, and we've, you know, you don't even hear about it anymore, but this is 87,000 people, most of whom are going to be agents at the federal level to be law enforcement uh, protectors of, uh, of the, of the, you know, of the IRS, of the Internal Revenue Service. So uh, there's a lot that I just said there, but it all comes back to you know, we must take care of our own homes first. And then then once we've done that, then we can, you know, still be this shining city on a hill, this, you know, this true north beacon uh, for the rest of the world. And you know what, America, we can juggle we can juggle a couple of things at the same time. We can juggle the the, the requirements for our country that must be adhered to and must be you know fixed and corrected, particularly the rule of law. We can do that. And at the same time, we can also be benevolent to uh, other parts of the world, other partnerships, alliances that we have to be able to to help, you know, where where there's tragedy, to be able to help where there's where there's tyranny. We can do that. We can do that. We're, we're we are so capable of doing that. But but before we start thinking about those things that we're doing overseas, which is a lot of what this when I look at the foreign policy of this current administration, I'm like saying, we have massive, we, are, we have stove fires, you know, our, our kitchen's on fire, our living room is on fire, the upstairs bedrooms are on fire, the bathroom's on fire, the garage is burning and our cars are already burned, you know, and, and yet we're, we're, we're starting, we're worrying about these other things before we fix our own home. And so, you know, that's my soapbox. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> you, you were saying last night that America First did not originate with Donald Trump. No, I mean, that's, no. that's something that's been around for quite some time. But the ones that are attacking that, yeah. <laughs> that America First movement, really do hate the country. Oh, they, ha- they hate the country. They hate that phrase. America First has been around many, many years, I, at least 50, if I'm not mistaken, maybe even more. You know, uh, uh, Donald Trump is his bumper sticker is make America great again. Right. Make America great again. And people will go, well, America's great. Well, America has some warts, right? We have some warts. I just highlighted a whole bunch of them. And, and, and many of those have been, have been in existence for certainly for, I, I would say, for 50 years. I mean, look at our education system, you know. Look at our education system alone. We're, we're spending more money in this country on education than like the next 10 countries combined. And yet I think we're rated at like 30 in, in what I would call legitimate, legitimately defined nation states. We're like at the, you know, we're at the bottom, really, when it comes to that. And we're, yet we're spending more money combined. So uh, why? You know, you have to ask why. And you have to say to yourself, when you look at the Department of Education at the federal level, number one, it hasn't been around that long, but for the time that it's been around, we have seen an education system, particularly public school education system, in decline. That's why you begin to see over the last couple of years, particularly with with COVID, and I, and maybe we touch on COVID and may, and what what may, what's being portended, you know, into the future here. But when you when you look at what's happening with many, uh, particularly women, you know, moms around this country, where they're pulling their children out of school, and we see the increase of homeschooling, or, you know, again, for the people that are listening to this show. And I'm, you know, this is my first visit here to this campus. I'm blown away by what these guys do. 
and and who they are and what they represent and how they how they do their their educational uh, the educational underpinnings of of what they're teaching here. I mean, it, you know, it's common sense. It's it's like what I learned. It's what I learned in the school system that I went to, which was we were talking to first graders and fifth graders this morning about phonics and vowels. They sang this beautiful vowel song, right? About I mean, it's these basics. They're learning about civics, right? In our country, if you know, if I was to sit with a and debate somebody on the left, somebody who's a Marxist, and debate them, you know, they would they would call me a a, a white Christian nationalist and, and you know whatever names they want to sling my way because I want to talk about what's great about America. And that's really, when we talk about America first, it's like your home. And I want to keep this driving this, uh, this metaphor or this analogy home. It is about our homes, right? And about your families and about our communities, right? And I always say, I say, you know, some people have misinterpreted it. I always say that most people really only care about what's 50 feet from their door. And it's a metaphor for taking care of our communities. And I use this phrase, local action equals a national impact. And so if you get involved locally, you get involved in your communities locally, uh, and you do the things that you know need to be done, you, you're going to have a national impact. And I can tell you from, from this visit, and this is what fires me up. This is, what, this is where I get my energy because trust me, folks, this is exhausting. <laughs> this is exhausting. And I, don't mean, and I mean it. It's exhausting because, you know, I want, I want more people to rise up. I want more people to stand up. I want more people in their local communities to, to speak up. And it is happening around the country, you know, more and more. And I, and I hope that it happens even more so. But, but this visit here is a reminder and, a, and it re-energizes me to have the perspective that I need that there is a goodness in, uh, in the fabric of our country. And it's represented by some of these young people that I met last night and some of the kids that I met this morning. And I know having uh, in the last week, week and a half, going to Michigan, I went to Iowa, I went to uh, Ohio, uh, I leave here, I go to, out to California, and then I go into Nevada. I mean, and one of the things that I always look for is not these conversations. And I love this conversation, and, I'm, and I appreciate you giving me this, this soapbox, um, you know, with uh, with the Trumpet Daily. But I, you know, what I what I look for is I look for the young people. I look for the youth, and particularly children, because I have I have children and I have grandchildren. So I look to see that, you know, my mom used to call it, and I joked last night with Steve. My mom used to call it force family fun. My mother would drag us to events, right? And we'd all be kicking and screaming, going, ah, you know, I don't want to go there, Mom. But my mother would take us there, and, you know, you'd learn something, right? You learn something. And, and, and it was important, and it's important to look at what our purpose in life is. As I said earlier, what my, what my age is and the generation that I represent, uh, this is the generation, it's my generation, that is going to have to stand up and speak up to, to save this nation, because those, those children, my children, your children, those grandchildren, your grandchildren that are out there, they're all going to school. They're trying, we're trying to raise them right. The children that represent you know, my generation, they're out, out there working, in many cases, a couple of jobs. They're trying to raise their families. And I go back to women because I keep, I find more and more women in this country, and we look at the demographics of our country, we look at, at what women are doing. This is a very important point because women are raising our, our, our families these days, right? We have so many broken families, and it's, and it's, a, it's a tragedy. Um, and, you know, and it's it, to me, because I think a strong family unit, you know, is really will, will make for a more successful nation. And, uh, and the, the globalists and the left and the and, you know, and the, the Democrat Party, and I'll use that, that's probably the only time you'll hear me using that word, you know, from the back, back in the late 60s all the way till now, they, you know, really, you know, it's like they intentionally went after the family unit. And I mean that. I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm, not, I'm saying that word, I'm using that word intentionally, precisely. They went after the family unit to destroy it, to destroy the fabric of the family. And they did it through a whole variety of things. And there's people that actually talked about it that uh, that are part of that 
that party. And, and now we now we've shifted. We've shifted to uh, a globalism that is really a a form of an, it's an ideology that is, uh, I think, per- personally, as I as I served in the military and I and I had to study and understand and be prepared to fight against these ideologies like communism, like fascism, like, you know, imperialism, whatever isms out there, Islamism, right? Radical Islamism, all of these different things. And so I, you know, I took the time to study those those ideologies and to study those cultures and to study to study the countries and the and the regions of the world and to, and to try to understand what it was that that I potentially had to advise uh, soldiers to go out and, and potentially sacrifice their lives. And now it's right here. The biggest battle, the greatest battle that I've faced, I've personally faced, you know, wasn't in uh, on the battlefields of uh, of of Central America or Southwest Asia or Central Asia or the or the plains of Europe, which I spent 10 years of my life uh, preparing for that battlefield to fight to face communism, right, to face the Warsaw Pact. My greatest battle that I that I have faced personally and now. And now in this position that I find myself in, and I'm blessed to be here, is, is right here in my own country. And that's, that's, it's a scary thing. It's a really scary thing. And I want people to understand that fear is an emotion that we can control. And like I said earlier, we have to gain control of that emotion of fear. And we have to understand, it's like I, you know, I, I'll use this, uh, you know, because I surf and I've surfed in big waves and I've been crushed. You, know, you wipe out, right? And you wipe out. Go Google wiping out on a wave. You know, you, you get pounded down below the surface of the water, and uh, and you'll you can spend. You know, I, I mean, I used to be able to hold my breath for quite a while. You know, not like some of these big big wave surfers. I could I could hold my breath for well over a minute because I practice that, and I've been underneath the water for that amount of time. And and you when you finally come up and you take that breath of air, right? It's like that's what America needs right now. We need to go take that that big breath of oxygen and everybody needs to do that. And then you need to say, OK, I am now going to move in the direction you know, of the shoreline. And that shoreline is the shoreline of freedom. And uh, and when we do that, when it, when when more and more Americans actually start to head towards that shoreline of freedom, we're going to reach it. We're going to reach it together. And when we do. We're going to raise that flag. We're going to we're going to be be uh, we're going to have you know demonstrate that American pride, and we're going to do that all over this country. And that's when I know and I and I see this. I see this here. I see this in other parts of the country that I go to, and uh, because people are overcoming that emotion of fear, and they know that they're going to eventually rise up and breathe that that beautiful uh, you know fill their lungs with that beautiful oxygen, that beautiful air, and we're going to reach the shoreline. And that shoreline means to get there, to get to that shoreline, it's, it requires sacrifice. And you're going to have to swim, right? You're going to have to swim. You're going to have to kick. You're going to have to crawl. Whatever it is it takes for you to survive to get to that shoreline. And when you do, believe me, you, you feel empowered. And I feel empowered. I feel, I feel, I, I, I reach that shoreline. I reach that shoreline in this battle with my own country, with, with elements of my own country, not with my own country, but with elements inside of my own country, who I believe are, are subversive. They're, they're subversive. And, and, uh, and I don't mind saying that. That's, that's the truth. It's quite a perspective. I mean, you fought. I mean, you've been in wars yeah. abroad. And so this is the most serious war that you've experienced. And it's right here at home. Of course, this is kind of the central theme of my father's yeah. book, America yeah. Under Attack. And yeah. uh, you, just so our uh, audience knows, you, I think someone you had said, Sent you a copy yeah, of it a I while mean, back. This is a beautiful book. Uh, you know, this this uh, this book written by uh, Gerald Florey, who um, uh, you know he he's the he's really the big idea behind this beautiful um, campus that we're on. And I met him um, last night, and we had dinner together. And somebody in all the my trips around the country, somebody um, they sent me this book. And they said, you got to read it. And, you know, in it, there's a chapter on Mike Flynn. And but I but, you know, and I, you know, he's, you know, you kind of go, OK, what's he's got, what's he got to say? But the title is says it all. America under attack. And and I recommend people. You know, I read it and and I and I was telling Steve that, 
that I've read a few books in the last few years that have uh, so, um, I don't know, they like shocked me to the core when, after I've read it. And I read this and I read it again this weekend as I prepared to come out here. And, um, and, I, and, and as I am, I'm the type of person like when I read it, I'm like, okay, now who wrote this? You know, now I'm looking at, you know, and I, I, I am compelled and I was compelled to reach out to, uh, to Gerald Flurry. And, um, and, and, and so they sent me a bunch of them because I said, send me some, send me a, <laughs> as many as you can. And I don't know how many you sent me, maybe 20 or so. I think it was 20. Yeah. And, I, re- and I, I handed them out to my family. I handed them out to everybody. And I said, you got to read this because it's not just what it says in here about, you know, old, you know little old General Mike Flynn. It's what it's, the, the theme of it and the, and the, and the idea behind it. And one of the things that I have learned in the last couple of years, and there's a there's a number of pastors that I have gotten to meet, um, and those pastors, and those people that are of great faith, and they're not necessarily all pastors, but but uh, but you know those the ones I'm thinking about now, that are able to connect, they're able to connect, you know the Bible, right? They're able to connect the Bible to the Constitution, and then talk about it in a way that. That, uh, as I like to say, what what this describes, what America under attack describes, is kind of the 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 who, what, when, where, why, and how. It really does is about what it is that we are facing, and he brings this sort of biblical direction uh, in it uh, as he leaves, you know, the reader at the end to make sure that we really do return to. The, the, the strength of our nation, which, are, which is really the foundation of our nation, which is based on Judeo-Christian principles and values. And one of the things that I, that I like to say, and this is why I reached out, and, I've, and there's been a couple of books that have, that have made me feel like that, and I've reached out to other, other authors to say, you know, your book had such deep meaning, and then I go out and I tell people, you know, to read them. I mean, I tell people, you got to go read these books. You know, if you want to know what's going on, if you want to Understand what's happening. Go read it. And one of the things that I that I say, and I think it's maybe it'll resonate with this audience, but I, you know, kind of doesn't matter. I mean, the way I am. But um, you know, when we think about and when we think about our our Bill of Rights, right? Our, our, our you know our our Ten Amendments, the First Ten Amendments, and certainly the Bill of Rights that we have in our Constitution. And you think about the Ten Commandments, right? The founders. All you got to do is read the Federalist Papers, read the Constitution, read the Declaration of Independence. For those that want to have a little bit more, go go read some of the diaries, some of the letters written by the founders to their spouses or to their children. Read some of their own historical accounts of what happened in their 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 um, diaries, so to speak, that they wrote. They're, they're 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 still available. And one of the one of the things that's very clear is that the Bible, you know. That the Constitution was was derived from the Bible. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you, you know, you can argue with me, you can, and the globalists will argue because they're, for most people, and, and I'll, it's just a little bit of a sidebar, but the globalists right now are going to try to attempt to use artificial intelligence to rewrite the Bible. Okay, this is ongoing right now, so just be aware of that because that's coming, folks. But the the our Bill of Rights and the Ten Commandments, if you think about it, are the promises that we make to each other, right? So we make promises to each other. Our Bill of Rights are promises that we make to each other as Americans, that we have all of these rights to be able to be free, right? To be, to be Americans. The Ten Commandments, they also are promises that we make to each other as, as a faith-based society. And look at what they've done to the Ten Commandments. Look at what the left has done to the Ten Commandments. They've thrown it out of every courthouse. They, they knock down the statues. It's, it's unbelievable. But those promises are important. And, and when you go read the Ten Commandments, go read the, the Bill of Rights today. Go do that. It takes you probably all of about 20 minutes. Then you, then you take the next step and you dig into the Constitution and you dig into the Bible itself. The Constitution and the Bible are the fulfillment of those promises. So in order to understand the deeper meaning of what our rights are and what the commandments say that we how we should live and there and it's it's all common sense it is all just common sense in order to understand the deeper meaning of that you've got to then dive into the constitution 
And, and I keep raising this up because it's a little thin thing. Takes you about, a good reader, about 45 minutes maybe to read the whole thing. The Bible is obviously going to take you a little bit longer. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I've read every single word, but I've, I've, I've read or been given enough of it to understand that there are components of it, of the Bible, just like there's components of the Constitution, this, again, the fulfillment of the promises that we make to each other, that are in our daily lives today. And our country is living, is living proof of that, you know, that whatever they, whoever it was that wrote all these great things thousands of years ago in the Bible, and these, those that wrote this beautiful thing almost 250 years ago, I mean, there, there's the, the wisdom and the vision and the meaning is so powerful. And, and so to be alive today, we don't have an excuse. You, nobody, nobody in this audience, you know, don't come and tell me, don't give me an excuse about anything. But you don't have an excuse to say, ah, uh, that's, that's for those politicians. That's for those pastors. That's for somebody else to do. As soon as you say that, you've quit. And the only thing that I know in life is, uh, that you're, is that you're done when you quit. And for those who have given, as, as uh, Abraham Lincoln, one of our, you know, to me, is, he's the greatest president. You know, as Abraham Lincoln described, you know, the when, you know, it's basically giving the last true measure of devotion, you know, in the cause of a nation, right? That's, that last true measure of devotion is the soldier on the battlefield that gave their life up. And, and I always say that it's not because they hate their enemy. It's because they love their country or they love their family or they love their community, you know, or they love the, the, you know, their, the loved ones that they left behind. Mostly it's a young wife and, 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 and in some cases children. And so, you know, when we try to wrap ourselves in, in, in our flag and our freedom, we, we have to do that you know, it, you know, keeping this idea of and this sense of humility to those that actually gave the, you know, that gave the last true measure of devotion, gave the greatest sacrifice that one can give, you know, uh, which is their lives in uh, standing up for a country, in this case, the United States of America, for freedom, right, for our freedom. And, uh, and we are, we're under attack. Our, all of our freedoms are under assault. And it's on a daily basis. And I know that this audience is probably a national audience, probably an international audience. And that's, you know, for those that are overseas, you all know what I'm talking about. For those that are in this country, particularly first generation Americans, maybe your parents came from another country legally and came into this country. Maybe they came from from uh, communist countries over in Eastern Europe. You know, maybe they came from some other part of the world. And so those first generation Americans know exactly what I'm talking about because their parents left another country. I mean, how about that? I mean, how, how, just, how about just picking up and leaving a country because you're so afraid of the tyranny that you're about to experience and you're, you're going for a place that where, you know, you're going to that light, right? That beacon of light, that true North Star that America represents. And when you are doing that, you're doing that knowing you're leaving family, you're leaving a life, and you're leaving your entire family, which goes back maybe hundreds of years in some cases, right? The legacy of you're leaving all that and you're going to some place where you know you're going to have to sacrifice and you're going to have to commit and you're going to have to raise a family. You're going to have to go get a job. You're going to have to learn a new language in many cases. So those of us that have been here for a long time, right? A couple of generations, I'm, I'm second generation or third generation now uh, in this country. And, you know, I mean, We've just sort of taken it for granted. And I hate to tell you, folks, but we've been apathetic and lazy in many cases. And, uh, and I want people to understand that. I want people to understand that we've got to stop being lazy. We've got to stop being apathetic. And we've got to start being Americans. And, uh, and the sacrifices here at home. That's, that uh, is, is you know, how I would tell you to repurpose your life and repurpose your lives and, and rethink about everything that you've done in the past has been relevant and good and, and, and right, but maybe it wasn't enough, right? Maybe it wasn't enough. I saw somebody on the social media today on, on one of the things that, that people are out there talking about, one of the things trending 
And, you know, one person says enough is enough. Enough is enough. And I agree. Enough is enough. So now what are we going to do about it? You know, are we just going to sit here and get and get pounded because America's under attack and go, woe is me and make up all kinds of excuses? Or are we going to go get involved in your communities? You know, go attend a school board, go run for school board, go run for a local office, go get involved in this country. And let's get these long in the tooth political people who have basically been ripping us off and let's let's get them out of there. And and I'll get off my soapbox in one second, because when I say that, people go, well, it's we have a an election system that's not fair and we have a, a, a selection system, not an election system. And I don't disagree. I don't disagree. So go fix it in your in your county. Go fix it in your county. You can fix it in your county. You can fix it in your county by not taking money. Right. And, and saying in our county, this is where the Constitution comes in. In our county, we're going to have no machines. We're going to have uh, same day uh, ballots. We're going to we're going to have ID cards, you know, with pictures. I mean, we're going to have just common sense thing and we're going to count our ballots on that day. Right. Because you got, you know, in a in a in a large county, you might have 100 precincts. Believe me, folks, we, we can do this. We've done this in the past. So anyway, that's just. You said in uh, you said the other night that October 2020, this was when I guess the DOJ finally dropped the charges, and you said that something like at that point you knew that they were going to try to steal the election. Could, yeah. Maybe you could elaborate on that a little. Yeah, bit. I mean, I so my case, my legal uh, case, was was uh, dismissed on the fifth of May of 2020. And and it was dismissed because the after a six month uh, special counsel investigation, which we weren't uh, we were not aware that it was occurring. We had heard different things. But we really weren't aware that it was occurring. And they, after six months of investigating what they did to me, you know, these unlawful thugs did to me, uh, the uh, Department of Justice dismissed the case. And that was May of 2020. So that was before, you know, what I facetiously call the summer of love, right? All the violence that we had on the streets of this country uh, with Antifa, Black Lives Matter, where they, I think that, I think the numbers killed and, and, and wounded were of police officers alone was like 30. And there was like $4 billion in damage in multiple places in a, in a very short period of time in a couple of states, right? You know, Washington, Oregon, Michigan, um, I think up in Minnesota. So after my case was dismissed, that, you know, anybody that followed my case very closely saw that the judge was not going to let go. And it was dismissed for egregious, essentially egregious government misconduct. So uh, then the judge kind of holds on to me. He kind of go, well, what's going on here, judge? You know, you don't have any authority to do that. Yet he, he did. You know, it, it, well, yet he continued to hold on to it for another eight months, you know, at, at, uh, at, at significant uh, irritation, I'll just say, right? I mean, everything about that was just horrific. Um, so when did I begin to see what was happening for the 2020 election? Well, we had COVID ongoing, right? We had the shutdown of the government, the, basically the destruction of our, of our small business enterprise in this country. I think 30% of small businesses in this country never reopened after, you know, churches were closed down, everybody's masked up, yet, you know, the Antifa crowds out there burning up, burning our cities to the ground. And so as a as a as someone who is, you know, I um, uh, as an intelligence professional, someone who analyzes situations and looks at things, particularly strategically, even though I can dig into the weeds and get into the tactics of of events, as I was started to see the mail in ballot scheme and right? I call it a scheme. Right. Because it's, it's so fraught with fraud in mail in ballots. So when I started to, to see these states like ticking off states that were, you know, all of a sudden, they, you know, this state's going to start having um, uh, mail in ballots. They started states started passing laws, mail in ballots and ballot harvesting was going to become legal. And I started to look and go, OK, when did this start? Because, you know, again, I, I'm, I am I am uh, uh, politically naive. You know, when it comes to a lot of this stuff, because politics was not something that I ever thought I'd ever be a part of um, in my military career. I, I never, never thought I would get involved in it. But I did once I began to see what was going on in our country. So 
as I started to look at the mail-in ballot stuff, I'm like, okay, what's, what's going on here and what's happening? And so you start to study, I started to study the, the states where they had mail-in ballots for a long time, much, you know, well before COVID. You know, a state like Oregon. And if I have my dates and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and sort of the ideological underpinnings correctly, uh, like Oregon, I think, started mail-in ballots like back in like 1998. And when you look at a state like a beautiful state like Oregon, we had a great event out there in Salem for anybody that's out in Oregon uh, that's watching this show. Uh, we'll, we're going to get back out there. Um, but when I looked at that state, I said, OK, 1998, they started mail in ballots. And I'm like, OK, well, then what happened? How, what began to happen? And I'm I'm doing this because as, as I'm fighting my legal battle, I'm you know trying to figure out what else is going on, because I, I knew that at the end of the day, I was going to rise above this. And I, and I felt that in my heart. And, uh, and my wife and I have a long, long, you know, uh, relationship together and, and talk, about a, talk about a rock of my family. And so as I started to study this, I'm like going, OK, Oregon, since 1998, I don't, I don't think it's been anything but Democrat. You know, it's been run by Democrats, right? The, the major cities in the state since 1998, since they instituted mail-in ballots. So you kind of look at that, just that one example, and that's an anecdotal, I know. But you look at that one example and you go, okay, now let's just look at some of the other others that are out there. And you begin to say, okay, and, and, and I'm hearing the attorney general at the time, and I'm hearing a lot of other people that are talking about mail-in ballots that, that, that knew a heck of a lot more than I did about mail-in ballots, how filled with fraud that it is. And that it was at that time. Bill Barr, we've played the clips many times yeah. on this show. He was on with Wolf Blitzer saying. Yeah, Barr said, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's a horrible, horrible uh, component. And, you know, I don't know if, if uh, I saw today, somebody sent me today, a, uh, not a clip, but a, an article about Hillary Clinton wanting to ha go, have the entire country go to mail-in ballots. Of course. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so. Mail-in ballots, and, and at that time, I'm watching all this, and I'm saying, man, there's something not right. And I, I uh, having served at the highest levels of our intelligence community, running the Defense Intelligence Agency, being the most senior intelligence officer, military intelligence officer in our nation at the time that I was there, and, and most people don't know the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, you know, also uh, oversees the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps intelligence components. Uh, and we, there's there's a, even budgeting, budgeting things that we get involved with there, as well as oversight and uh, direction, working in close coordination with the the service chiefs, right? Chief of Naval Operations, uh, the uh, the chief of the Air Force, chief of the Army. So it's a big job. And as I look at these things, I'm thinking to myself, man. And I and I'm and I'm also I'm also considering uh, our adversaries overseas, principally China, okay? Principally China. And one of the things that I do know is the infiltration into our government by, by these uh, anti-American ideologies, particularly communists, for many, many decades has been going on. And particularly the Chinese are very smart about it. I mean, they've been sending half a million students to our schools for the last 20 plus years our, to our, our, uh, our undergraduate and graduate level schools. You know, I mean, it, probably the year 2000 was probably... 200,000, maybe 300,000. Now it's probably it's it's probably more than 500,000. So let's just say let's just say average 300,000 a year every year for 25 years, at least 25 years now. So that's China sending those sending their students to learn, you know, the STEM, right? Science, technologies, the engineering and math, all these things. So these components combined with with this this falsehood and this fraudulent mail-in ballot scheme, you know, it just leads to corruption in our election system. And prior to 2016, prior to Trump winning in 2016, the Democrats were screaming about fraud. Mm -hmm. They were screaming about fraud. There's documentaries about it. So we've got to get back to the system, the constitutional system that will allow people that, that still believe that our nation is built on equality, right? Equality, meaning when I go to vote, if I'm a homeless person, but I'm still registered to vote because I just can't get a job and I'm the most wealthiest person in the United States of America and I go to vote on that voting day, guess what? We're equal. We are equal. 
I don't care what that guy's worth and what that guy's not worth. And he's worth, that guy that's the homeless guy is, is worth a lot. He's worth a lot, you know, because he's struggling and he's trying hard. He's trying to, you know, rekindle his life. But when they go into the voting booth, when we go into the voting booth, we are all equal. And right now, the American people do not trust our system. So when I talk about our elected officials, we, we have not had one governor. Okay, not one. And I'm in Oklahoma. Okay, so, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to get you guys into trouble, but that don't matter. I mean, for me, it's like we haven't had one governor, not one sitting governor, not one that has said, that has yet said maybe the 2020 election maybe had a little bit of fraud. Even that. Okay, we haven't had one governor that has said that. Not one. You know what they're all doing? They're all letting their egos get in the way of this country and the future of this country. And when you look at the landscape of political candidates running for the highest office in the land, a lot of them are governors or former governors. And you kind of go, you know, because when you become governor, somebody whispers in your ear, oh, now you might, you know, you have a chance of being president of the United States of America. So don't blow it. That's the establishment whispering in their ear. So we haven't had one governor because if we did, if a governor had the guts to stand up after 2020 and say, you know what, we got some problems here. This doesn't feel right. You know, I mean, you know, it's like old if it you know, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, moves like a duck, swims like a duck. It's a duck. Right. So it didn't feel right. It didn't feel right then. And it definitely doesn't feel right now. And all that's happened is more evidence has come to come to bear. And we still don't have any of these governors. What are they? Why? Because they all want to run for governor. Oh, they all want to run, run for president. And it's like, quit allowing your ego. And I, I, you know, I'd love to name a few names here, right? But I mean, they all, everybody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> quit allowing your ego and your fake and your false faith getting get in the way of our country's future and the and the future of our children and our grandchildren. Why? Because. This is for real. It's not just this book. It's this message. It's this title, America Under Attack. And we are under attack. And boy, have I, have I felt it. Have I felt it personally? And guess what? Luckily, blessed, you know, through I, 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 you know, I wrote a book called Letter to America. And in that book, I talk about faith, faith principally, family, which is a component of faith, and friendship. And what I describe as true friends. Because and every and, and many many people on this uh, in fact everybody everybody on this sh- that listens to this show because there's not a human I've met in my life that hasn't had a tragedy that hasn't had something happen to them that hasn't had something bad happen whether it's a death in the family a divorce a drug a- addiction whatever you know uh, alcohol addiction you know something bad happened in your life and when it did. Who were the people that came to your life? Who were the people that came right into your immediate circle and said, I'm, I'm with you and, I, and I'm going to stand here with you and I'm going to help you. I want to help you. Right. That's when you're at, when you're at your worst. When you're in one of your when you're in that, as I describe sometimes the Psalm 23, when you're walking in that shadow, in the shadow of the valley of death there. Right. Right. Who's actually. Who's coming to your aid? And that's when you learn about true friends. And that's why I talk about faith, family, and true friends. Because we have a lot of friends in our lives and a lot of acquaintances in our lives. But when, you know, when things don't go your way, you know, your company goes bankrupt, let's say. You know, you've been, you've been living high in the hog. You've been living, you know, the life of a, of a, good, of a good American, right? Your capitalism is fine. Make some money. You work hard. And all of a sudden things go south. You know, are the people that that you got to that level and you helped get to that level, are they coming to you? And I do think that a part of that, and I'm spending probably more time than you want on that, but I do think that a part of that is is we also, like I just talked about with with these uh, governors and these these people that are running for a political office, right? That you know, don't let your ego get in the way of of what is really a strength of of the American. It's one of the one of the greatest character traits, I think, of I saw it in American soldiers is humility. And the idea of humility is so powerful because when you're on the battlefield, and there's great examples of this, and you're on the battlefield and you're engaged with an enemy, 
you know, life or death situation. And, you know, when you when you witness something like uh, a soldier, a young soldier, and you really don't even know what his background is, you know, but he, more than likely he comes he comes from a family somewhere in this country. And you see that soldier, young soldier, I'm talking like 18, 19 year old kid, and he goes to protect a child. Right. And he turns with the child and this is a great example from the Iraq war. He basically turns and protects the child and and he takes the child to safety all at the expense potentially of his own life. You know, he's turning his back on 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 fire that's coming at him and he saves the child that 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 act of humility. I think that's not just an act of courage and an act of bravery. That's an act of of humility. That's that's humbling yourself. You know, wow, because I'm thinking about it. It's, it. it's powerful. That's humbling yourself before something so powerful and you don't even know uh, what that is. But yet you're going to go do that. What what we don't we don't train that in the army. That can only come from somebody who just has such a deep seated sense of their of themselves, whether it's faith or whether it's their freedom or whether it's their their, you know, their wife back home or their child or their brother or their uncle or aunt. It doesn't matter. It's it's such a deep seated thing that I think only comes from being a uh, from 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 experiencing um, and and understanding who you are and having that humility as an American. If we have that. It doesn't mean that you cannot be and not, you're not and you and you should not demonstrate bravery and courage, you know, uh, under fire. You know, sometimes that's just that's the way it is. Uh, but it just means that you have to remember who you are. And I wish that as I was just talking about governors and and talking about our election system, I wish that people would be more humble and step toward the fire and take the incoming that's going to come as governors. Right. If you're a governor and you say, I, I think the 2020 election was stolen. I, everything I've seen, it looked like it was rigged. Looks like it was rigged. Now, I have the right to say that because my freedoms right now say that. Allow me that. And a governor is going to take heat from the from the big time left wing media and the mainstream media. They're going to take a lot of heat, you know. But if they're really true to themselves and they and they and they, you know, they stand on their own values and principles then they should be able to take the heat. Heck, if they want to be president of the United States or they want to be governor of a of a state, God, you hope that they have that kind of humility and courage. So anyway, the theme wow. of uh, tonight's uh, lecture series at Armstrong Auditorium, that is America in crisis. We're looking forward to that. You've got another soapbox tonight. Yes. Yeah. And last I checked, it was like 670 people are coming. So yeah, hopefully great. we'll hopefully that's we'll great. sell uh, 30 or 40 more tickets as the day uh, continues. But make sure you come out to Armstrong Auditorium tonight at 6 p.m. That's uh, right here on the campus of Herbert W. Armstrong College. And uh, the event, as I say, starts at 6 p.m. He, he's going to be speaking. There's going to be a Q&A, so you can uh, ask the general a question. We've got some music lined up. Uh, it's just going to be a special event from top to bottom. That's uh, We actually went a little past time today, but that's okay. We've got so much more to get to with General Flynn. We're going to try to squeeze every minute that we can out of his stay. He leaves tomorrow, so uh, hopefully we can record uh, another short segment or two and play it uh, on the Trumpet Daily uh, later this week. You are listening to Stephen Flurry and General Flynn, and uh, we want to see you again next time. It was awesome. <laughs>